outside of its legitimate functions, government does nothing as well or as economically as the private sector of the economy. <laughs> now, we have no better example of this than government's involvement in the farm economy over the last 30 years. Since 1955, the cost of this program has nearly doubled. One-fourth of farming in America is responsible for 85% of the farm surplus. Three-fourths of farming is out on the free market and has known a 21% increase in the per capita consumption of all its produce. You see that one-fourth of farming, that's regulated and controlled by the federal government. In the last three years, we've spent $43 in the feed grain program for every dollar bushel of corn we don't grow. Senator Humphrey last week charged that Barry Goldwater as president would seek to eliminate farmers. He should do his homework a little better because he'll find out that we've had a decline of five million in the farm population under these government programs. He'll also find that the Democratic administration has sought to get from Congress extension of the farm program to include that three-fourths that is now free. He'll find that they've also asked for the right to imprison farmers who wouldn't keep books as prescribed by the federal government. The Secretary of Agriculture asked for the right to seize farms through condemnation and resell them to other individuals. And contained in that same program was a provision that would have allowed the federal government to remove two million farmers from the soil. At the same time, there's been an increase in the Department of Agriculture employees. There's now one for every 30 farms in the United States. And still, they can't tell us how 66 shiploads of grain headed for Austria disappeared without a trace and Billy Solestis never left shore. <laughs> Every responsible farmer and farm organization has repeatedly asked the government to free the farm economy. But how, who are farmers to know what's best for them? The wheat farmers voted against a wheat program. The government passed it anyway. Now the price of bread goes up, the price of wheat to the farmer goes down. Meanwhile, back in the city, under urban renewal, the assault on freedom carries on. Private property rights so diluted that public interest is almost anything a few government planners decide it should be. In a program that takes from the needy and gives to the greedy, we see such spectacles as in Cleveland, Ohio, a million and a half dollar building completed only three years ago must be destroyed to make way for what government officials call a more compatible use of the land. The president tells us he's now going to start building public housing units in the thousands, where heretofore we've only built them in the hundreds. But FHA and the Veterans Administration tell us they have 120,000 housing units they've taken back through mortgage foreclosure. For three decades, we've sought to solve the problems of unemployment through government planning. And the more the plans fail, the more the planners plan. The latest is the Area Redevelopment Agency. They've just declared Rice County, Kansas, a depressed area. Rice County, Kansas has 200 oil wells and the 14,000 people there have over $30 million on deposit in personal savings in their banks. <laughs> when the government tells you you're depressed, lie down and be depressed. We have so many people who can't see a fat man standing beside a thin one without coming to the conclusion the fat man got that way by taking advantage of the thin one. So they're going to solve all the problems of human misery through government and government planning. Well, now, if government planning and welfare had the answer, and they've had almost 30 years of it, shouldn't we expect government to read the score to us once in a while? Shouldn't they be telling us about the decline each year in the number of people needing help, the reduction in the need for public housing? But the reverse is true. Each year, the need grows greater. The program grows greater. We were told four years ago that 17 million people went to bed hungry each night. Well, that was probably true. They were all on a diet. <laughs> but now we're told that 9.3 million families in this country are poverty-stricken on the basis of earning less than $3,000 a year. Welfare spending 10 times greater than it was in the dark depths of the Depression. We're spending $45 billion on welfare. Now, do a little arithmetic, and you'll find that if we divided the $45 billion up equally among those 9 million poor families, we'd be able to give each family $4,600 a year. And this, added to their present income, should eliminate poverty. <laughs> Do 
Direct aid to the poor, however, is only running about $600 per family. It would seem that someplace there must be some overhead. <laughs> now, so now we declare war on poverty, or you too can be a Bobby Baker. <laughs> now, do they honestly expect us to believe that if we add $1 billion to the $45 billion we're spending, one more program to the 30-odd we have, and remember, this new program doesn't replace any. It just duplicates existing programs. Do they believe that poverty is suddenly going to disappear by magic? Well, in all fairness, I should explain there is one part of the new program that isn't duplicated. This is the youth feature. We're now going to solve the dropout problem, juvenile delinquency, by reinstituting something like the old CCC camps. And we're going to put our young people in these camps. But again, we do some arithmetic and we find that we're going to spend each year just on room and board for each young person we help, $4,700 a year. We can send them to Harvard for $2,700. 